Welcome to the Mike White Podcast, where I, Mike White, share my conversations and book reviews through my journey to learn all that goes on in this amazing world. Buckle up and enjoy the ride. Hey guys, on this week's episode, I'm joined by Mr. James Lavish. James has decades of experience as an institutional investor in hedge funds and private equity. He now refers to himself as a reformed hedge fund manager since he's dedicating his time to foster Bitcoin education and adoption. I highly recommend you check out his weekly newsletter, The Informationist, where he breaks down current financial topics, shows why they are important to your life, and describes how you can use them to your advantage. Don't forget to follow James on Twitter as well for great macro and Bitcoin insights. Note, nothing on this podcast is financial advice. It is for educational and entertainment purposes only. With that, enjoy the show. All right, Mr. James Lavish, thank you for joining me this morning. I'm excited to share your story and, and talk some Bitcoin. How's it going? Awesome. I'm, I'm happy to be here, Mike. Thank you for having me. Well, you're definitely one of the biggest names in the Bitcoin space and had a very successful career in, in just be in private equity and hedge funds. And so I want to get down to it. I want to start with the miracle on ice growing up there in upstate New York. <laughs> How did that impact you growing up? Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's funny because going back, my, you know, my dad was an athlete. He was a baseball player and, you know, he's a, a lot older. So he was actually, he tried out for the, um, he tried out for the New York giants before they moved out West. So, um, in baseball, he was a shortstop, but when we grew up, we grew up way up North and he thought, well, uh, I want to expose these guys, these, these kids to something else. So we played hockey. And naturally, I was only three and a half, four hours away from, you know, super northern New York and maybe four and a half hours away from Canada. So it uh, we grew up in that in that super cold climate and there was winters were deep snow. So it made sense. But yeah, 1980, um, Lake Placid was two and a half hours away from my house. I got to see USA play Sweden that first game. I saw them. Uh, tie them. And that was, uh, there was a huge thrill. Couldn't believe it. Um, and, uh, I didn't get to see the final game, but I was watching, uh, you know, very intently. You're way too young to know about this, but in 1980, you know, the miracle on ice, like you said, there was, we just figured there was no shot, you know, for the U S to win. But then when we beat the Russians, it was like, well, now, I mean, all we have to do is win one more game and we've done it. And so, um, yeah, it was a thrill. And to be honest, people ask me all the time, like, are you disappointed you got hurt? You, you couldn't play professionally for longer or get up to the NHL. And my, my answer always is, you know, the biggest disappointment was I got hurt right before the Olympics. And, you know, I don't know if I would have been on the team. I was close. I was, you know, one of the last five or so players that that were on that national team that were traveling traveling around and playing in tournaments but you know that's the one that hurts the most i just i got to wear the usa jersey but not in the, the olympics and so that's the one i that's the one i really wanted so that's still a, a top tier in in a hockey career and in, being drafted by the bruins too out of high school what a what was it in growing up that gave you that drive to be so focused on hockey? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I, I, quite honestly, I mean, I was just a naturally a pretty good athlete. Um, and, uh, you know, I got my dad's genes and I loved being outdoors. I loved being, I loved moving, you know, uh, anything kinetic. I just wanted to be out there and I would stare out the window when I was younger and I was uh, in grade school, I would just stare out the window and wish I was running around the fields or playing soccer or baseball or something out there. And it drove me crazy to be sitting, seated at a desk, trying to pay attention to some material or, or, you know, lecture that I had absolutely no interest in none. And, uh, my mind was racing. I could, I couldn't get out of the classroom fast enough, funny enough. So, um, Which is, it's crazy though, because you must've been pretty good at the classroom stuff to get into Yale. So how did you balance that? <laughs> I, well, I, I grew into it. <laughs> Honestly, what, what I, you know, uh, Mike, I'm, I'm pretty good at math. And so, um, I was really good in the math and science side of, uh, 
things. And, uh, and then I'm also something that, that a lot of, uh, listeners or a lot of uh, people who, who I talk to or follow me don't know about is I was a, I was actually an artist. I was a, I was, I drew, um, you know, uh, and so my drawings and my art was, uh, it was a really big deal in high school. So I kind of balanced between being a hockey player and being an artist and having that math and science. Um, you know, my, my writing caught up later. Uh, it took me a little while to really understand how to write. And I, I, I learned a lot of that in college. Um, they'll grind you down in, in schools like, like Yale, where it's a liberal arts school and communication is absolutely, uh, you know, it's essential to, to be able to communicate properly because you, you have these classrooms where you break out into small groups and you have to be able to communicate your ideas and, uh, and debate and, and talk through, um, you know, different issues. And so that was important. Um, but yeah, I mean, quite honestly, there are no, there are no, um, there are no scholarships, athletic scholarships to Ivy League schools. So um, the the hockey did help. I mean, let's let's face it. There's no way I would have gotten in to Yale without hockey. And those schools, they they just require. This is one thing that I think a lot of kids don't understand these days. Um, they they think that they should go and uh, you know, going to college is a whole nother, that's a whole nother debate, but let's just assume that it would be a good idea to go to college. And, uh, somebody wants to get into a top tier college to a Stanford or a Yale or to a, a Harvard or Princeton, you know, they figure what they need to do is take the hardest classes, you know, be part of all the clubs and, uh, get all straight A's work at a soup kitchen. And, and that's just not the case. This is not, it, that's not reality. The reality is they see, Th and tens of thousands of kids like that every single year but what they're looking for is somebody who stands out and so somebody who brings something exceptional to the table um you know and uh, there are a lot of different ways you can do that whether you are an exceptional writer i mean my my first year at yale i lived in a in a quad uh, which was a double quad and on beyond the firewall so in my in my room i was with a there was a diplomat from saudi arabia's son uh, um, an author from Boston Sun, uh, a football player from from Kansas, a, a white Jewish football player from Kansas, um, a, uh, a a a another a basketball player on the through the door from uh, Cleveland. Uh, we had a uh, an a, an exceptional uh, English major. This this writer uh, who was in that room. There was a uh, an Olympic fencer in that Jeez. room, yeah, and then somebody who had actually uh, developed and and brought a play to off Broadway. So at eight, 19 years old, eighteen years old. So you know everybody had something that they were bringing to the community, and that's something that that uh, that's what if if I gave anybody advice now, and I've done it with my kids, and you know I'm doing it with my stepdaughter now. It's you have to have something exceptional for the, for them to want you to you know, you're going to bring that to the community because they can choose from anybody in the whole world, you know? And so that's what they want. They want to build communities of, of not just leaders, but people who have talents that will, that will teach each other. Because quite honestly, Mike, I learned more in, from my classmates and from the people I met at Yale than I did in the classroom. I mean, yeah, I learned some, you know, some essential uh, liberal arts tools, but beyond that, it was the life experience and hearing, hearing about all these things that, that all these other people were into and did. So you didn't learn any free market economics there in Yale? You know, it's kind of funny. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> there, there were, there were, there were some, uh, accounting classes and I did take, uh, I did take that one, um, investment class, uh, there but um yeah at the time honestly i was just so young and here's the thing if you're not in if you're if your parents don't are not aware of money and this is what's really important for all these people that we talk to every day in this community is that if you're not aware of money and we feel like well we're just exposed to it all the time that's all we're thinking about we're looking at the economics macroeconomics but if you don't know that stuff 
you're, if your parents don't know, if they're not aware, you're not exposed to it because you don't learn this in the classroom. Right. And that's, so that's a good question. And, and that, that one class there was just, it was just an investment class, but man, it was so basic. And it was, it was, it was nothing that I would, that, uh, would really vault me into understanding all the things that we talk about every day here. So, and going back, my dad was a, I guess the show is about my dad, but <laughs> so he was a, uh, he was a nuclear engineer. He was not, he did not, he was not an investor. Mm -hmm. um, he was a guy who made his money, invested in us in, in, you know, in the different sports we were doing or in uh, some experiences, some, some summer vacations, but mostly in, uh, in colleges. But beyond that, he just squirreled it away. He didn't, he didn't understand just how powerful, um, how powerfully against us the inflation was working, for instance, you know, especially through the eighties, it was just a really difficult time. And if you didn't understand investing, you didn't get it, but yeah. So, um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was a great experience. I, if I could go back and do it all again, I absolutely would. Um, you know, but, uh, just, um, it's, <laughs> it's you just realize when you get to my age just how little you knew and i mean quite honestly I, that investment class that you were that you just asked about that was david swenson who who taught that class at the time he was a young uh cio of the yale endowment and he was just starting to um you know blaze that trail of in having endowments invest in things like private equity and hedge funds so he would he would you know, raise the alpha of, of that endowment by going out on the risk curve and, and getting some different kinds of investments. Cause mm -hmm. before that it was all just stocks and bonds, 60, 40 portfolio, but he went out on the, but I didn't understand that at the time, you know, and he wasn't really teaching us that he was just teaching well, us the basic structures. So well, no one, no one gets taught that at all in, in high school. Like you don't have those classes at all. And it's, it's kind of crazy that you have to get that base knowledge at a Ivy league institution as the, being first introduced to it. It seems like our whole system's kind of backwards in that way. Oh yeah. And I mean, I've learned so much more uh, just over the years through actually working in, in wall street for 30 years, but from Bloomberg, from articles, from understanding how the articles are wrong from uh and not just on bloomberg from other you know from all the mainstream uh media outlets i mean i read something this morning that was just flat wrong but you know it you don't know this stuff until you've actually done it for a long time and twitter now i mean there yes there's definitely misinformation out there but there's a lot of extraordinarily smart people who are extremely experienced you know to be able to just flip on and hear uh Druckenmiller talk about the, the debt issue and how he's seeing it and all the things he's experienced and how he's approaching it. You couldn't do that back then in, in that, you know, day and age. Now you can learn it everywhere, but it's essential for you to take that time and dig in and learn it and find those and find those nuggets because you're not going to be taught them in school. And so that's why we, we talk about money all the time with my kids. Not that it's the most important thing or the focus, but so they understand it and have tools around how to approach it and uh, and understand how the system can work for or against them, you know? So, but those are things that we're not taught. You're right. It's absolutely opaque. We're not, but you're, you're changing that. And you're talking about if you're trying to go to a good school, doing something exceptional, something exceptional that you're doing is, is the informationist newsletter. And it's breaking down all those complex topics on money that people aren't taught or taught and you break it down in a really easy to understand, actionable manner. Uh, how how uh, long did it take you to write that way? Like, what? How does one yeah. get to your level? <laughs> well, thank you. I really appreciate that because that is absolutely my goal. That's what I want to do. So, I mean, um, there's a few things. So, first of all, I I just you know, when I when I started the newsletter, I wasn't really sure exactly what it was going to be, but I wanted to give people an insight to what was going on in the in behind the scenes of institutional investing and how how institutional investors look at the world and maybe what we might see versus what somebody who's just on Main Street might see. And so, because like we just said, it's so opaque. They're, you're, the the uh, institutional money managers and analysts they're not they're not being paid to 
give you information about how that sausage is made. They're just getting paid on charging you fees to, for them to make the sausage for you. Right. So, um, they don't want to give out that recipe and they don't want, they want, then it, it, they feel smarter if they can confuse you with all of these acronyms and terms and concepts and, you know, and talking about CBS. Yeah, exactly. It's just, it's, and it's mad it's mind numbing and it frustrates me. And so, uh, anyways, going back to the information. So I started writing that newsletter and I was talking to my wife and she's uh, and she's a novelist and she's a, um, a, a really good writer. Um, she's a New York times bestselling novelist. So she really understands how to write. And, um, and so she's helped you know, craft, and uh, she's helped me craft, uh, and, and, uh, and learn how to craft, uh, writing in a way that is simple. And to me, the hardest thing to do is to simplify something. And it's a real challenge to take, to take something that's really complicated and to simplify it. Yep. That's yep. such a challenge. And so, um, but I love it. I love that challenge. And I love, I cannot tell you how much I love hearing from my readers that, when I get messages from them or emails from them, they say, oh my gosh, I finally understand this. Thank you so much. This was broken down in a way that I could understand it. I'm a doctor or I'm a nurse or I'm a fireman or, you know, I've got pilots. I've got, you know, I mean, I've got some Wall Street people and uh, a lot of them and uh, especially investment advisors. And, you know, these concepts are just not, they're not readily, they, they, you know, explained properly. And you can go on to chat GPT and ask them que- and ask it questions. It's not ready. I've done it. And it, it just doesn't, it doesn't know how to break it down that way. Um, but anyways, uh, so yeah, so I just, it just evolved into something where I, I realized that my gift is to take these concepts and to break them down for people. And I love it. I sit down every Saturday morning, I uh, throw on English premier league, uh, soccer, football, and, um, and, uh, just have the games going on in the background as I, as I type something up and, and, and work through it. So. And additionally to that, your, your Twitter too, you have pretty in-depth threads or it's not just, you'll, you'll have some good short tweets, but then you go into, it's almost a newsletter in itself into these t- threads. And I wanted to cover one with you. Yeah. It was the, the five codes that, uh, the five hedge fund codes that helped you survive 25 oh, years. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was a great one. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was my first one. Um, that was, so that was kind of what started the whole Twitter thing for me is I wasn't really sure, you know, again, what was, what my presence was going to be on Twitter. I wasn't, I wasn't in Twitter. I wasn't, uh, you know, I wasn't really into it at all. I didn't really care about it. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm kind of an anti social media, I'm, you know, I'm not quite a boomer. I'm Gen X, but, you know, I just felt like it was such a waste of time to always be uh, on social media and just scrolling and scrolling. And like, it just, it, it didn't, it, it didn't appeal to me. But then I realized that, yeah, Twitter was actually a place where you can, you know, find ideas, explore them, and then explore them with other people. Um, so yeah, that was my first thread. <laughs> it's a little bit clunky, but I guess it got the point across. No, I like it. It's top five. And the first one was uh, never, never be the smartest one in the room. And I wonder if you could uh, talk more. Yeah. On you know, that's uh, that, and that's a, that's an important one. I learned that really early on. Um, one of my mentors in on wall street, one of my first bosses, he said, look, if there's anything I can, I can tell you, um, well, there's a few things, you know, like, don't believe them. Don't believe you're worth the money that you'll make. Um, but one of the things that he said was, if you surround yourself with people who are smarter than you at all times, then you will succeed. And, you know, um, don't, don't worry about trying to be the smartest one in the room. And in fact, if you are, then you're in the wrong room. And so, um, and that was, that was kind of advice I, that I, took to heart really quickly. I didn't feel like I didn't ever feel like I was the smartest one in the room on wall street. There were a lot of smart guys, especially when I went to the hedge fund side. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I've seen a lot of people get in trouble. Uh, and that story that I told was a, was a a guy who was an absolute genius. I mean, hands down one of the smartest people I've ever been in the room with. Um, but, uh, 
he, arrogance got in the way and he and he didn't want to reach out and, and get any opinions on on these positions and it blew him up and uh and it was painful um but uh you know um yeah it, it that's uh that was a that was a hard lesson that that happened a little bit later that i saw that happen but um it's 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 one that you you want to be sure that and this is why i tell everybody that i work with who who i've ever hired or any of the interns or any of the analysts that i've worked with um there are no stupid questions there are no stupid questions i don't care if you feel dumb and if the and if in a manager if a manager makes you feel stupid if you've asked something mm -hmm. like you should know that by now or something you know then that's not a good manager because you need to feel safe to say, hey, look, um, am I doing this right? Because, Mike, you've got so much money on the line. And a lot of it is not your money. It's your investor's money, you know. And if you're just going to wing it or you're going to try to teach somebody a lesson and have that money at risk because you're trying to teach them a lesson, say you go figure it out yourself, man, that is not that's not where you want to be. So uh, no stupid questions is a big one, which means that you, you ought to be in the, uh, surrounded by people who are smarter than you, right? Do do you find yourself in the seat of kind of the, the smartest guy in the room now regarding Bitcoin? And your <laughs> no, fellow never. Hedge fund colleagues? <laughs> no, come on, man. I'm, 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 I hang around with like Larry Lepard and Jeff Booth <laughs> and Preston Pish. And I mean, these guys are, you know, these guys are geniuses. Yeah, Greg you guys Foss. are, but, but what about the, what's the pushback from your, your colleagues in traditional finance have, have they, do they talk to you a lot about Bitcoin? You know, I, you know, I know there is a couple people from my old world that I do talk to, um, about it. And a few have popped up since, uh, since I, uh, started, um, launching this hedge fund, the, the, uh, Bitcoin opportunity fund. And a few have definitely popped up on my Twitter feed, but you know, it's just not their, it's not their world. They don't really know about it. They, or at least they didn't when I, when I was uh, working with them. Um, and, uh, so it, I'm, I'm sure it looked at least a, a year or two ago, completely foreign to them. And they, they, they were probably scratching their heads. Um, but once, once they realize that this is about sound money, it's not about some token that you're trying to ride to, you know, rocket or, a, you know, some sort of moonshot. Um, when they realize that this is really about sound money and that the macroeconomics of the things that we're there, that we're studying, um, are essential to, to why this is so important. And so, um, yeah, I think that once they get around to that understanding, Mike, then they'll, you know, they'll look at it differently, but quite honestly, no, I, I, the institutional world is far behind. It's way behind still. I mean, they still lump in Bitcoin with just all the other crypto. And it's just, it's, it's, it's a difficult, um, misunderstanding to get over. And part of it is just so much noise and poorly written media mm -hmm. that is attacking and just lumps Bitcoin in with everything. Like they just don't understand it. And so, but I feel like we're getting over that this last uh, few months in particular with the, with the banking crisis has been super important for Bitcoin, you know, and, uh, and I, that's waking some people up. And even if they are, are resisting it, it's waking them up to realizing, oh, oh shit, we do need something other than fiat currency that my bank can hold and can lock up on me, can freeze on me, you know? And CBDCs are not the answer. And gold, as much as I think gold is a great long, long-term store, store of value, that's not the answer. That's not perfect money. So um, yeah, it's interesting. Is that is that one of the main goals of the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund that you started? Uh, is for those institutional investors once they realize the, the the switch flips and they see that yeah there is no path out of this debt spiral. I need to get some hard sound money. I can invest with the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund. Yeah, I mean that's uh, eventually. Right now, we're not we're not actually going after institutional money. I'm not talking to endowments. I'm not talking about, uh, you know, I'm not talking to, um, you know, uh, institutions, um, pension funds. They're just we're just not big enough. We won't be big enough. Um, they need they need uh, a fund who's hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in order to put in uh, 
a small allocation themselves. Mm -hmm. So, um, but right now what I'm trying to do is get uh, smaller family offices and for individuals to have this opportunity. And really it's kind of two, it kind of, it's, we have two goals, right? So one goal is to help all these small companies, these Bitcoin focused companies that um, have found themselves, you know, side blinded by, by blindsided, you know, sideswiped by all the nonsense and the nefarious activity this last year. And so, um, and because the market has, has dried up for liquidity quite a bit in, yeah. in this space. And so you're seeing that there are, obviously we know about the miners that got absolutely wiped out this last fall um, and, uh, and going into the winter. And then you, you know that there, there are a lot of solid companies, whether they're hardware or software companies, the Lightning Network or wallets, um, financing, whatever it may be, that are Bitcoin focused but are suffering from the inability to raise capital, especially at a, at a valuation that they had garnered a year, two years, three years ago. And so now they're out there trying to raise money and they're, and they're doing down rounds of 50, 70, 80 percent. Um, and so what that means is they're struggling to get capital. But if we can help these good companies that have good managers, that have really solid prospects, get some capital, well, that gets us to that that point where we're getting that billion users in place the billion users of bitcoin in place that's what we want to do we want to help drive that um and at the same time on the flip side of that we have investors that who will be rewarded for taking that risk you know and so uh, as the bitcoin as the, as the bitcoin opportunity as the bitcoin ecosystem grows then we'll take advantage of that and we'll help these struggling companies so it's really a deep value more distressed kind of focused fund um, that is helping out these struggling companies, but giving great opportunity returns for investors who are willing to take some of their capital that's not earmarked for Bitcoin, but also funnel that into the Bitcoin space, you know? So we tell people, if you don't own Bitcoin, then you need to do that first. You know, that is primary. And then yep. after that, this is another way to get exposure to that, that huge growth that we expect in the next five or 10 years. And you're talking about how those Bitcoin companies got hit by the fraudulent stuff going on with FTX, things like that. And it seems like most of the world still doesn't distinguish Bitcoin versus crypto. What's your thoughts on, on why that is? And do you have, are you optimistic of that changing anytime soon? Yeah, I'm super optimistic. You know, um, first of all, just the it, it, it's difficult to uh, it for the, there's so much misinformation out there. And the problem is, it's just it Bitcoin and, and crypto have have been lumped in on all the mainstream media news outlets forever. You know, <clears throat> whether it's the New York Times or the CNBC or Bloomberg or whoever it is, they show it all up there together. You know, I, I mean, at one point, I think I saw XRP up on the screen for for Bloomberg, uh, you know, with it had Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, like uh, it, it's just maddening that they have them all listed together. And so people think, oh, the crypto market, the crypto market, um, as people realize that Bitcoin is the ballast, that it's not just because it's the it's the, the first one. It's not it wasn't the first one. It's just that it's the one that is most stable. It's the one that's most decentralized. <clears throat> and of course, it's the largest. And as that grows, so I think what's going to happen here, Mike, is as more and more people realize how they can use Bitcoin, the people that need it, like we're US centric, right? So all we think about, like the, it's number go up for so many people here. It's just all about how much money can I make in it? How much money can I make in it? How much money can I make in it? Will I make more in Ethereum? Will I make more in Bitcoin? Like, where should I put my money? That's okay. To put that over there. It's nonsense. You know, the most important thing is that you have people who are in, you know, whether they're in Venezuela or they're in, uh, you know, um, Iran or they're in Lebanon. Lebanon is having major currency problems, yeah. you know, uh, Argentina, wherever you, you're seeing currencies 
inflate rapidly and people don't have a way to store that value of their hard their their hard earned their energy that they've expended you know their hard earned money they don't have a way to protect it as more and more people go into get into the ecosystem from the ground up you know it's it's really grassroots but in the right way these are the people who need it and they're finding a way to take that money that they have and store it even if it's volatile it doesn't matter to them it's nowhere near the same volatility because if it's bitcoin is volatile on a, on the way up right mm -hmm. Whereas their currency is volatile on the way down. So where do you want to be? It's, it's an absolute no brainer for them to move their money into Bitcoin. They can't buy gold. They can't go anywhere with gold. You can't buy real estate. You can't go anywhere with real estate. It's totally locked up. And how can you buy one one hundredth of a house? You can't. So what they do is they're, they're taking their, you know, their Venezuelan uh, currency or Lebanon or, and they're, putting it into Bitcoin and realizing, wow, there's a place I can keep this that the government can't get to it. I can take it with me anywhere around the world because it's not with me. It's up there. You know, um, it's it's literally just a slice of this time chain. And if I own that slice, I own the key set or the 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 code to that slice, then it's mine and I could take it with me, take it with me anywhere. And now that there people are learning that slowly that's that's how it works right and so then what happens well as we have more and more of these banks have have problems right uh we're, what we're seeing is that there's kind of a barbell in the united states of attitude on bitcoin in particular first it's been the leading risk on asset for a very long time for years so when the when the fed printed money bitcoin shot up along with gold and than you know tech stocks and when and as they've drawn out liquidity and they started tightening rates bitcoin went straight down from you know went down almost 80 percent because it's leading risk on so as people were taking risk off that sold off and so what we you know what i expect is that that will reverse again but you've got a camp of of investors that look at it that way and now you have this new camp of investors who are who are traditional investors, who are traditional money managers and just everyday people who are saying, oh, God, is my money safe in the bank? I mean, even if it's FDIC insured, is it safe? I don't know. And it's scaring them and it should scare them. And what happens if the United States government decides to just freeze our accounts and not let us withdraw money? What if I need money? You know, so. And so now you have this, the, the, it's a flight to safety away from, you know, the, uh, the, the government and the fed mismanagement and manipulation of money. And now you're seeing cracks form the system that are, they're leading to credit events right now. They're just interest rate events, but they're, they're leading to credit events. And so you've got two camps it's risk on, and it's, you know, completely risk off. So now in reality, it's still a super volatile um, you know, it, it, protocol investment, but that will change. And you talking about other countries outside the U.S., it's, it's way more obvious than the people here that only have to 8% inflation or whatever they want to call inflation is, is a lot. And that's, that's nothing to what other countries have seen. Oh, but you're talking about them being able to freeze your, your assets. We saw that just north of the border where, I mean, it's, it's not America, but Canada is a very American like country and just, yeah. the, you know, snap of the fingers, all those truckers didn't have access to their funds. So yeah. I, and people and people who helped them. That's right. Anybody who was perceived as helping them, their funds got locked up. That's right. It's scary. I mean, scary. It, and that happens to you. You realize just how powerful these governments have gotten and how, if your money is the bank, it's not yours. That's a loan to the bank that they promised to pay you back. You basically loaned your money to them. You, you put your money in deposit in the bank, you loan it to them for them to do whatever they want. They make other loans out of it. They make 10 loans out of it. They only keep five or 6% sitting there, right? And then they buy these treasuries, long-term treasuries that are impaired in value because the Fed raised rates so quickly that now if they need capital and they sold those, well, they're down 30%, 40%. That's a problem. So that makes them insolvent. I mean, it, 
it's such a mess, Mike, that I don't know how we get how we get through this completely. It's calmed down for now, but we're about to see another shoe drop with the commercial real estate market, you know? And that's your your claim to fame, I think, in the Bitcoin space. You're you everyone talks about you with the debt spiral and you eloquently put that article out and lay it all out how, like you said, we have to pay our bills eventually. So I would imagine we're gonna print, there's gonna be some sort of QE and our debt's just gonna get out of control. What what is the end game? Is is there any hope if if maybe AI is really good and we are really productive? Can we can we recover from it? Well, that's the, okay. So there there's a problem, right? So there's a lot there's a lot of issues. That, I mean, that, to unpack some of that, we'll, we'll unpack it a little bit simply for for everybody listening. For those who have not heard of the debt spiral, to put it in simplest terms, the United States government borrows more than it makes every single year. What do I mean by that? Well, the United States government doesn't really make anything. We we are productive. We, you know, you talk about the GDP, gross domestic productivity, you know, gross domestic production. That's us. And the United States taxes us. So they 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 will go in and take some of that, right? And uh and so that is the the tax base. And so this year they're expecting to, they were expecting to get $4.8 trillion in taxes this year. Um, we're seeing that that's a lot lower uh, because, you know, cor- corporate gains tax and there's, a, um, a, you know, a capital gains tax and corporate taxes and in, in individual and tax are all lower. Um, but the problem is we have, we basically have three line, line items, Mike, that are, uh, that are line items that you can't really move, right? They're, they're, they're kind of etched in stone. Those three line items are your entitlements, which are like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and all that. And they total up to like $3.8 trillion. Okay. These are these are things that are signed into legislation that you can't, there's nothing you can do about it. They're they're there. You can't move them. And then we have about eight hundred billion dollars that that we're spending on military, right? So military spending. So now you're at like four point six ish right um and then you've got and this is last year's numbers right and these are not these are not my numbers these are the, this is the congressional budget office that puts out these numbers every year and it it's for everybody to see and they're actually super optimistic which is even even more you know even scarier but then on top of that um you know uh so you've got you've got those you've got the your your entitlements and you've got your um You've got your defense spending, right? But then, you know, um, you've got your interest on all of that debt that you that we've issued. We've got thirty one point seven trillion dollars of debt that we're paying interest on. Forget about the, even just the entitlements, just the, the debt that we pay interest on every year. Well, that interest rate on that is now going up, right? So, first of all, if you if with the Congressional Budget Office, they expected to pay about 600, somewhere between 600 and 700 uh, billion dollars of interest on their debt this year. Well, that number is clearly way higher. It's not even, it's way higher. And it's, we're already seeing it uh, in the first quarter here, okay? Why is that? Well, because we don't, we're operating in a deficit, right? So you add up all those line items, Let's say it's only seven hundred billion dollars of of interest. Now you're at four point five trillion, right? I'm I'm sorry. Let's back that up. You're at like five point three trillion ish. Okay. okay. We're only remember the tax receipts were only four point eight a trillion, so we're already in a deficit. Okay. That's so cool. as you retire those bonds, well, how how do you pay for them? I mean, people, the investors need their capital back. You've been promised to give them their capital back. If you don't, you default on your debt. So what do you do? You issue more, more debt, right? You issue more bonds. You borrow more money to pay off the past debt. The problem is the past debt was at maybe a half a percent or 1% or one and a half percent. And now you're issuing debt at three and a half, four and a half, five and a half percent, you know? So depending on where you are on that, on that timeline, on the maturity, where the where the treasury uh, decides to issue those bonds, how far out, 
you know, whether they do a one year, two year, 10 year, whatever. So you're borrowing at higher interest rates. And so you're not able to close that gap of, of the deficit. And even worse, we're seeing the tax receipts are down about 30% from last year, right? So this year, instead of, um, instead of the, the government expecting the CBO expected to be about a $1.4 trillion deficit, it's going to be up in the high twos. It's well above $2, $2 trillion this year. So they expect it to hit $2 trillion deficit in 2028. We're going to hit it this year. Jeez. And we know that because the, uh, the CBO put out a report that, that broke down all of the, all of the different uh, line items and we're already at $1.1 trillion for the first six months. And that CBO doesn't even price in a recession, right? They, they're not calculating if the, the lower yeah, tax revenue. Good That's a good point. That's right. They're not, they're, they're not even pricing a recession. So it's, it's a debt spiral. There's no way out of it except to either uh, cut. So the, what do you do? There's three things you can do, right? You can either uh, have austerity have an austerity program, which they forced in like Greece and Spain back in the day, right? Or um, in Italy, or you, uh, which is cutting its spending. And so that's political suicide. Nobody wants to do that. We're watching it happen right now in, in the government wrangling over whether they should raise the debt limit so we can issue more debt. They don't, you know, so nobody wants to cut spending, right? The Republicans don't want to cut it for their, for their constituency. The Democrats don't want to do it because it, it loses votes, right? So you take away something that somebody already has, it, it, it takes away votes. So they're not going to do that, you know? Um, so you could raise taxes, but raising taxes actually in the long term winds up uh, negatively impacting productivity. Because if you have higher taxes, you know, you're just not incentivized to produce more at a certain point. So you don't. And so eventually what happens and it hurts, you can't expand as much. When you're giving money to the government instead of expanding your lines of business and hiring people and producing more, well, it has the same effect. Your, your GDP goes down. So higher taxes don't work, right? So, and then what's the third thing you could do? You could just issue more debt, right? That's the easiest thing. So that's what they do. So but- Right. So, but what are they going to do going forward? Well, they talk about inflation ad nauseum. They talk about inflation, how they want to get it down. They need to get it down. They want to get it down. They need what they need to get down is the perception of inflation. That's what they need to do. And why? Well, we need inflation, Mike, in order to help pay down that past debt. If you have high inflation, you have, uh, and you know this, but for your listeners, if you have high inflation, then you have higher nominal productivity, nominal GDP, Like right? You're making more dollars, you know, because the dollar is basically worth less. I mean, you're, you, it's inflation. You're making more dollars. Things are sold for more. Wages are higher, you know, so GDP looks like it's bigger, right? So then they tax that, that bigger number. And they pay off that old debt that they issued when the, when the number was smaller, when the dollar was worth more, when there was lower inflation, right? So it's a way to pay down that old debt and keep this charade going, kick that can down the road a little bit, especially if there's super high inflation. Like if we have a period in here where we have, you know, 15, 25, 30, 50% inflation for a, a period here, two, three, four years, well, that'll pay down a lot of that debt. It'll wipe out a lot of people but it'll pay down a lot of that debt. Um, but that's, a, that's something that could happen, especially if the Fed is forced to print a massive amount of money. And Luke Groman talks about this quite a bit. So um, it's a, and that's a possibility, but I do expect them to let inflation run hotter than they admit to for a long time. And that will help that problem. Do you, exp do you see uh, the global reserve currency status kind of maybe stopping us from kicking the can down the road quicker or is BRICS yeah, like that's a, a competitor? That's a, yeah, that's a good question. People ask about that all the time with BRICS. Um, so BRICS is the Brazil, uh, Russia, India, China, and South Africa uh, contingent who, uh, and Iran just uh, 
just uh, applied for membership. Saudi Arabia is talking about it. Um, but basically there, you know, other countries who are, who are on, who are, they're on the fringe. They're not exactly allies with the United States. Um, other countries are looking for a way to loosen uh, the U.S. hegemony grip, grip on the world. Uh, everybody uses dollars. Everybody needs dollars. And they're tired of that. You know, we saw what happened, what a major, massive fumble it was for us to freeze Russian treasuries and their assets and shut them, shut them off swift, the, the payment system, the communication system. That was just, that was a major misstep. Why? Because it signaled to the world that if you own treasuries, we can seize them. We can turn them off. We can freeze them on you and you'll be left without capital without access to your capital. And so these other nations are looking away to, to loosen that grip and get and have a, an alternative uh, store of value, alternative, uh, you know, um, reserve asset. And will they find it? That's, that's the, that's a tough one. I wrote all about that in one of my newsletters very recently. And really what it comes down to is none of them are really trustworthy. And so if they're going to do something like that, they need a, a, a reserve asset that, it, that their currencies are all backed by or one currency is backed by that they're all agreeing to use. And whether that's gold or it's Bitcoin, they need something that they can audit. They can send people in or they can look at a ledger and see that the, the, the asset that their currency is backed by is actually what it said, what, you know, at the level it's, they say it is. Do I think it, it unseats the U.S. dollar and the U.S. Treasury as global reserve currency and global reserve asset? Not for a very long time. You know, I think that, that the U.S. dollar is going to remain the global reserve currency, you know, likely for my lifetime. Um, as far as the Treasury is concerned, there's, there's a likelihood that that gets unseated in the future. And whether it's by gold and Bitcoin, you know, um, and there's just multiple reserve assets around the world, that's likely now, especially because we have what we've done and uh, being in the debt spiral. There's there is going to come a point where there's just so much debt, Mike, that we crowd out the marginal buyers for the the extra debt that we have to issue which means that we need to print money, put it at the Fed, have the Fed buy our bonds in order to keep up the charade and literally expand the money supply in order to pay off past debt. And it will go parabolic at one point. I don't know when, but it will. And, uh, and that's, when, that's when buyers of, the, of, that, of those treasuries lose confidence. They're not sure they're gonna, going to be paid back or you know, more likely they know that they're, that the U S is continuing to have soft defaults, meaning they are, they are printing so much money that the dollars you're paid back in 10 years, 20 years from now are, are worth a fraction of what they were when you bought that bond, when you loan that money to the government. So that's the problem that I see. And that's why I think that, you know, Bitcoin could absolutely be a solution to that. It could I, be a solution I, 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 to, to, to that, that problem that all sovereigns are having. Sorry, go ahead. No, I a hundred percent agree. And I think it's, it's just, people are going to realize and the producers, I, people, I think a lot of times people will talk about the countries, but it just takes the people that are actually making the products and, and doing this and like, Oh, I don't want to partake in this system. I want to use a, a trustless form of payment that I don't need to rely on a Saudi Arabia or a United States. I just rely on who I'm, I'm transacting with. So I'm, I'm super bullish on Bitcoin. Exactly, 100%. And I, before before I, we uh, finish this up, I, I really want to talk about nuclear power because your dad yeah. was a, a yeah. nuclear engineer. Yeah. And you, you told me he worked on designing the, the turbine generators that they have on the submarines. And it, probably the timeline worked out. I know the ship I was on was commissioned in 1990. That's awesome. So I would imagine your, your dad probably helped design those specific turbine generators. Did he talk to you about nuclear power a lot? So yes and no. 
Um, so he, my dad worked for, uh, he worked for GE for many years and that got bought out. His, his division got bought out by Lockheed, um, which got bought out by Martin Marietta, right? So uh, he kind of bounced, bounced through um, the different uh, companies, but he was basically in the same division with one client. And that, that, one, that one customer was the U.S. Navy. And oh, yeah. all they did, right? <laughs> and uh, all they did is, uh, is design steam, steam turbines for nuclear-powered submarines. That's what his division did. And so um, he could tell me some things, but not everything, because they were designing subs that I wasn't even allowed to know about. And uh, he worked in a building that had no windows. I don't know how he did this for so many years. Uh, but he, he would go into that building every single day with no windows and uh, and deal with problems. And they were math problems. They were highly complex and, and challenging. And uh, and he was telling us after one, um, you know, I was in college and uh, or just just about out of college. And he was talking about how he had been working on one problem for 10 years. And that was bonding two plates of metal together in a in a um, a tube that the the steam would pass through in order to make sure that that bond was absolutely seamless and that the steam would not produce friction against that seam which as you know Mike having been on these would would tip off Russians and, and you know and China or whoever North Korea that you were in the area because that would make just enough noise that they'd be able to pick up on it. That yep. steam going through that, you know, that, that pipe. And so he worked on that for 10 years. He solved it. I don't know how he showed us the, he showed us some of the documents that he had gotten out of, uh, out of his, uh, out of his workplace, but it was like 80% black lined. I mean, I could barely under, like, it was like, it, there's so little that you could glean from it. But it was interesting. So he did. He did that. Um, yeah. So it was. It was I great. love those stories because he's a. It's a true American hero. Like sa saving lives and keeping that advantage over all the rest of the submarine fleet because we have awesome submarines. And and like I said, 19, 1990 was the the SSBN I was on. Yeah. And it's still still out there today, uh, functioning as 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 good as it ever has. So it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Uh -huh. They're and they're, yeah, they're, they're built to last forever. He would be, you know, and he died a number of years ago. Um, and, uh, but he would be so, he would be such a Bitcoiner. He would be <laughs> so into this and he would be trying to find ways to, to help people, um, find nuclear power to plug yeah. these things in. Because as we know, um, when you have a nuclear reactor, that has to be that has to be running full steam all the time or you know or else you you run the risk of of a meltdown right you can't just turn the part of it off it just doesn't work right so yeah. um so he would understand that bitcoin mining would be a perfect way to you know have a marginal buyer of excess electricity that you could build for the future so we could build these power plants for the future and have Bitcoin running on a percentage of that. And I mean, the government could be, you know, mining Bitcoin right now and creating an, an, an alternative, a store of value, alternative uh, reserve currency for them, a reserve asset for themselves and be building energy at the same time. It's just, he would be so all over this and it, and, and I'm sad that he didn't get a chance to, to, to see it, to see it evolve. But I'm also happy he didn't, he didn't have to live through the last three years. So, oh gosh. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's fascinating. He would be, he would love it. And, and it's really the public perception. It is a, probably one of the safe, it, it might be the safest form of energy we have. And uh, mm -hmm. there's no reason that people should be as scared as they are about it. It's unfortunate. Like Chernobyl was really bad and, but there was a lot of human error, a lot of human error flaws. Yeah. Third, no. Three mile Island, human error, you know, it's, that's absolutely true. Um, and we have processes to fix that. We have great procedures and, and robots that 
even if we do mess up now, like you, you got to have a lot. It's like the Swiss cheese model. You have to have a lot of consecutive errors to actually have something go wrong. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So yeah, um, I think it's a mistake that we're not growing more. I can't believe that Germany just shut down three perfectly good reactors. That's absolutely in that's insane. insanity. It's, it's yep. insanity. And you know, the only thing I can think of is there, there's no other explanation for it, Mike, except they want to oppress their citizens. There's absolutely no explanation for it. They can't, there's no, there's, there, nope. you cannot, you, you cannot win that argument. They, like there's just, it's insane. And so, or maybe it's not, maybe it's not insane. Maybe it's purposeful. And that really is disturbing. So um, yeah, we're going to, we're going to keep, I'm, I'm all for nukes. Um, I think that, uh, I think that they'll, they'll save us energy independence, you know? Well, hopefully, uh, we see a, a world full of Bitcoin and, and nuclear power in the future, James. Uh, thank, thank you so much for taking this time to, to be on the podcast and I want to make sure everyone knows to check out your newsletter, the informationist, go to the Bitcoin opportunity fund. I'll have all the links in the show notes and, as yeah. well as, oh, we didn't even talk about the Looking Glass Education website <laughs> right. to learn. There's so much good learning material. I'll have a link to that yeah. and in Twitter at James Lavish. So uh, uh, thanks so much, James. Yeah, I really appreciate you uh, having me on, Mike. I need. I have to say that the uh, the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund is for accredited investors. Uh, the SEC makes me say that. It's just reality. I wish it was. I wish it wasn't that way. I wish we could have everybody in it, but maybe in, in the future we'll be able to have a fund that has everybody in it. So, um, but it is an absolute pleasure. Uh, I appreciate you having me on, and, and look forward to the next time. Love it. All right. See you. Thank you for listening to the Mike White Podcast. Be sure to follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Mike White Pod, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Y'all have a great day.